Hi, room 15. This is chapter 27, The Doctor. This is the second to last chapter of Secret of Nim. Enjoy. The next morning, Mr. Fitzgibbon started the larger of the two of his two tractors, the huge one he kept in the barn, the one that pulled the combine in the fall harvest. With help from Paul and Billy, he bolted the big boulders or blade to the front of it, rumbled it up through the barnyard gate, and stopped it near the rose bush. We'll wait until they come, he said, turning off the engine. Mrs. Frisbee could not bear to watch, and yet even more, she could not bear not to watch. She knew there was nothing to be gained by it, nothing she could do. Yet how could she stay at home when ten rats, including Justin and Brutus, were waiting bravely underground? She could not. She thought at first of her watch hole in the corner post, then she decided against it. Near the rosebush on the edge of the woods stood a hickory tree, its scaly bark like a ladder inviting her to climb. Ten feet up of this tree, a large branch jutted straight out. On this branch, up close to the trunk, she had a vantage point from which, herself unseen, she could look down on the rosebush and also see into the woods to the blackberry bramble, where, though she had never been before, she was sure the rat's rear exit must be hidden. She settled down to wait. It was a chilly morning with a damp breeze and a gray mist that blew in by patches. Somewhere near the middle of the morning, a square white truck came into the driveway. It went to the first house. It went first to the house. A man in white coverall uniforms climbed out and knocked on the Fitzgibbons' door. It was too far away for Mrs. Frisbee and Miss to hear the knock or to hear what the man had said to Mr. Fitzgibbons. But ten seconds later, Billy ran from the house to the barn where Mr. Fitzgibbons was working. The man returned to the truck and waited, standing outside the open cab door. So through the windshield, she could see that two more men sat in the front seat and that one of them had long horn-rimmed glasses. Now Mr. Fitzgibbons approached the truck, Billy dancing beside him, apparently in some excitement, there was a conference, none of which Mrs. Frisbee could hear, accompanied by gestures toward the rosebush and the waiting bulldozer. The man in white climbed back into the driver's seat and drove the truck across the grass. He backed it up beside the bulldozer, stopping perhaps ten feet from the bush. Mrs. Frisbee stared at it. If there was anything printed on it, it must be on the other side, away from her. Then three men climbed out, and she could hear what they said. It's a big one. Right, all right, said one of the men, and look at those thorns. It's hard to see how even a rat could get in there. The man in the horn rims walked around the edge of the bush, examining it closely, and he bent over. Look at this, he said. There's the entrance hole, very neatly hidden, and look behind it, a path leading in. Look at this, he said. Oh, I just read that part. Whoops. <laughs> he turned to Mr. Fitzgibbons, who had walked up with Billy. You're right. You need to bulldoze it. It would take us all day to hack our way in there. But just cut it off at the surface if you can. If you dig too deep and open the hole, you'll get it away. They'll get away. He added, you better tell the boy to keep back. We'll be using cyanide, and it's very dangerous. Billy, after some argument, was dispatched to the back porch where Mrs. Fitzgibbons was also watching. One of the men had walked around the far side of the bush, the side near Mrs. Frisbee's tree. Doc, he called, there's another entrance in the bush, and there's a hole just inside it. Doc was the man in the horn rooms. He was a doctor. Mrs. Frisbee thought, Dr. Somebody... He must be in charge. Can you get at it? He asked. Not very well. There's too many thorns. The man who was a doctor walked around and looked at it. No, he said. Anyway, that, there, that would be the escape hatch. We'll find the main hole nearer the middle of the rose bush. He turned to Mr. Fitzgibbons, who had mounted the tractor. Okay, said the doctor. Can you push it that way, away from the shed? Mr. Fitzgibbons nodded, and the motor started with a roar. He pulled a lever and flexed the heavy steel blade up and down, bringing the bottom edge of the rest just even with the ground. The blade was fully eight feet across. He pulled another lever. The wheels with cleated tires as tall as windows dug in and the blade scraped forward. The bush fought back, then yielding angrily, yielded angrily, snapping and cracking before the inexorable, ex, inexorable, that's a weird word, uh, thrust of steel. A single sweep and a third of it lay a writhing heap of thorns in a pile 20 feet away. The ground trembled under the wheels, and Mrs. Frisbee thought of the ten rats huddled below. Suppose the weight collapsed the earth, caved in the storage room, and trapped them. Another sweep and a third. Only a thorny stubble now stood where the rosebush had been. On the porch, Mrs. Fitzgibbons covered her eyes with her hands, and Billy cheered in excitement. Plainly exposed were two holes, simply round rat holes. There was no trace of a small mound, nor the elegant arched entranceway. Arthur had done his work thoroughly. Mrs. Frisbee wondered for a moment at the second hole. Then she remembered him saying, We'll give him a rear exit to block. Of course, they had dug another hole. Most likely, she thought, just a dummy leading nowhere. The men in the white suits went into action. The back doors of the truck were opened, and a long, flexible pipe was unrolled. 
It looked like a fire hose, except that at the end, instead of a nozzle, there was a round plunger like a rubber ball cut in half. One of the men donned a mask with a glass visor and a tube that ran to the back of his pack, a gas mask. The masked man, the masked man pulled the hose over to the center rat hole and pressed the plunger over it, covering it completely. From the back of the truck, the other two took a large box made of wood and wire, almost a yard wide, and placed it over the second hole. It was a cage, but half its bottom was a trap door, neatly mounted on hinges. This they raised, placing the open door directly over the opening in the earth. Then they backed away, one of them holding a trip cord which would close the trap door after the rats were inside. All set, the doctor called the man in the mask. The mask nodded. Keep back now, said the doctor to Mr. Fitzgibbons, who had left his tractor to watch. He walked to the truck, reached inside, and turned a switch. Mrs. Frisbee heard the soft throb of a pump. Now. She turned to watch the blackberry ramble into the woods. Would they hear the pump? Where were they? Oh, let them come out. Almost a minute passed, and the men in white watched the trap, and nothing moved. Then she saw it. Behind the bramble, half hidden by a swirl of mist, a gray-brown gray shape, a rat, shaking dirt from its ears. Another. Then three more. They huddled in silence, waiting. More. How many? Ten? Seven? Only seven. Where were the other three? Still, they waited. Then, as if by agreement, they stopped waiting. They ran, all seven, of them, all seven of them, not back into the woods for safety, but out of the woods, toward the stubble of the rosebush, towards the men. At the edge of the bush, they stopped, as if in confusion, and ran to the left, ran to the right, then fled back into the woods again. Now that they were out of sight of the men, but not of Mrs. Frisbee, instantly they regrouped behind the blackberry bramble and charged out again, but this time in smaller numbers, first two, then three, then two again. She saw what they were up to. They were not, they were not in, le in the least confused. They were making seven rats look like 20 rats or 40. A steady stream of them. In the mist, in the hectic turning, running, turning, and hiding, she could not tell whether or not she recognized any of them. The men shouted, Look at that! A pack of them! How did they get out? Get the nets! The doctor turned off the pump. The man with the hose pulled off his mask, and a wave, as a wave of new rats danced along the edge of the clearing, all three men ran to the truck and pulled it from the long-handed nets. But Mrs. Frisbee, up on her branch, was staring at the blackberry bush again. She saw something that all the others, including the rats, did not see. An eighth rat had come out. He emerged running, but then he stumbled. He got up and ran again, this time more slowly, circling vaguely to the right. He did not seem to know where he was going. He reached a sparse thicket of sapling, almost out of her sight, and there, abruptly, he fell over on his side and lay still. Meanwhile, all three men, holding their nets low, ran across the stubble toward the parade of rats, but as they approached the parade, it vanished. The rats, their purpose accomplished, melted into the misty woods, and this time they did not appear, reappear. Mrs. Frisbee watched them as they loped away swiftly in single file and disappeared from her view. Back into the deep forest and up the mountainside, the rear guard was gone, bound for Thorn Valley. But the eighth rat still lay unmoving among the saplings, and the two had never come out at all. They're gone, said the man who had worn the mask. They fooled us. What happened? Asked Mr. Fitzgib asked Mr. Fitzgibbons. Oh, that's hard to say. Simple enough, said the doctor. They had two escape holes, and they used the other one. He walked back to the blackberry bramble and bent down, kicking the branches aside with his foot. Here it is, he said, quite a long tunnel, one of the longest I've ever seen. The other two men, he said, to the other two men, he said, get the pick and the shovels. For half an hour they dug, laying open a narrow trench along the tunnel. From her angle of view in the tree, Mrs. Fris Mrs. Frisbee could only see the top of the trench and not down at the bottom. Still, she watched, saying to herself, perhaps after all, there were only eight. Maybe they decided that eight would be enough. Then one of the shovels broke through the air. They come to the rat's storage room. There's two of them, said one of the men, and her heart sank. Who were they? She wanted to run and look, but she did not dare. Careful, said the doctor. They may still have some gas in there. Let the wind blow it out. Phew, said one of the men. That's not gas. That's garbage. Open it up a little more, said the doctor. One of the men wielded his shovel for another minute, and the, and the doctor. then the doctor peered in. Garbage, he said. Last night's dinner. Garbage and two dead rats, Mrs. Frisbee thought. He sounds disappointed. Only two, said Mr. Fitzgibbons. Yes, it's easy to see what happened. In a hole that size, there would have been a couple of dozen at least. But there, too, must have been at the front, near the tunnel. They got a whiff of the gas, and it killed them. But before they died, they must have warned the others, so the rest ran out. Warned them, said Mr. Fitzgibbons? Can they do that? Yes, said the doctor. They're intelligent animals. Some can do a great deal more than that. But he did not elaborate. 
Instead, he turned to one of the men. We might as well take these two back with us. From the truck, the man produced a white paper sack and a pair of plastic gloves. He pulled the gloves on, reached into the hole, and placed the two dead rats in the sack. He did this with his back to Mrs. Fisby, so that she never got a glimpse of them. All right, said the doctor. Let's close it up. She shoveled, they shoveled the dirt back into the trench and returned to the truck. Let me, let me know if you have any rape. Let me know if they have any rabies, said Mr. Fitzgibbons. Rabies, said the doctor. Yes, of course, but I doubt it. They all look perfectly healthy. Perfectly healthy, thought Mrs. Frisbee sadly, except for being dead. She looked into the woods, over toward the sapling, where the other rat lay. Was he, too, now dead? To her surprise, she saw that he was moving. Or was he? In the mist, it was hard to tell, but something had moved. After the truck had left, Mr. Fitzgibbon stood looking at the ruin of the rosebush. He seemed vaguely puzzled and disappointed. He must have been wondering, she thought, whether it has been worth it just to exterminate two rats. She had no way of knowing, of course, that all the rest were also gone and would not return, and that his grain loft was safe. In a moment, he turned and walked to the house. As soon as he was safely gone, Mrs. Frisbee scurried down from her tree and into the woods. On the ground, she could no longer see the rat or the thicket where he lay, but she knew the direction, and she ran. Around a stump, over a mound of leaves, past a cedar tree, there were the saplings, and there lay the rat, still on his side. It was Brutus. Beside him, futilely trying to move him, stood Mr. Ages. She reached him, breathless from her run. Is he dead? No, he's unconscious, but he's alive and breathing. I think he'll revive if I can just get him to swallow this. Mr. Ages indicated a small cork bottle, no bigger than a thimble, on the ground beside them. What is it? It's an antidote for the poison. We thought this might happen, so we got it ready last night. He got just a little of the gas, made it this far, and then collapsed. Help me lift his head. Mr. Aegis has been un had been unable to lift Brutus's head with the bottle at the same time. Now, with Mrs. Frisbee's help, he forced open Brutus's mouth and poured in just a few drops of the smoky liquid the bottle contained. In a few seconds, Brutus made a gulping noise, swallowed hard, and spoke. It's dark, he said. I can't see. Open your eyes, said Mr. Aegis. Brutus opened them and looked around. I'm out, he said. How did I get here? Don't you remember? No. Wait. Yes. I was in the hole. I smelled gas, an awful choking sweet smell. I tried to run, but I stumbled over somebody laying on the floor, and then I fell down. I must have breathed in some of the gas, and I couldn't get up. And then? I heard the others running past me. I couldn't see them. It was darker than night. Um, then one of them ran into me and stopped. He pulled me up, and I tried to run again, but I was too dizzy. I kept falling. The other one helped me up again, and I went a few steps more. He kept pulling me and then pushing, and somehow, finally, I got to the end of the tunnel. I saw daylight, and the air smelled better, and there was nobody else there. I thought the others must have left, so I ran a little further, and that's all that I remember. Mrs. Frisbee said, What about the one who helped you? I don't know who it was. I couldn't see, and he didn't speak at all. I suppose he was trying to hold his breath. When we, all got near the, when we got near the end, and I could see daylight, he gave me one last shove towards it, and then he turned back. He went back? Yes, you see. There was still one rat back in there, the one I stumbled over. I think he went back to help that one. Whoever he was, said Mrs. Frisbee, he never came out. He died in there. Whoever he was, said Mr. Ages, he was brave. <laughs>